This episode of the podcast is supported by Audible. You can download and listen to the world's best storytelling. I use it all the time to and from work. You can listen to audiobooks, original series and more on their free app. To get your free 30-day subscription, which includes a free book, click on the link in our show notes and enjoy. Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. Today I had a great conversation with Hubert Virio, who is the CEO of Yotel, and they're a really cool hotel chain that have hotels around the world, um, key airports and key cities, and they're embarking on a really aggressive growth strategy to open more hotels, so really, really interesting. And we speak about Hubert's story, so what he's done and how he's got to be the CEO of Yotel. And we hear about Yotel, so what their concept is and uh, the fantastic growth that they're going on at the moment. Um, we also speak about the changes and dynamics going on in the hotel industry and how he's seen it change over the years. It's a really cool conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. Hello, Hubert. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure. All the way from Marlebone. Oh, that's quite far away, isn't yeah, it? It's quite far. <laughs> I've been really looking forward to speaking to you about Yotel, the hotel industry, and all of that good stuff. But before we do, I'd love to hear how you got to where you got to and, and what your story is. Absolutely. Thanks for that. Uh, it's actually a funny story how I got there because I started in hospitality probably 20 years ago. Oh, wow. I uh, did a hotel school, started with one of the big hotel brands, and very quickly decided that hotels were not for me. So I left the industry. Oh. And <laughs> How come? Uh, I don't know. I was much more interested by real estate, investments, right. alternative investments, and, and so forth. And, and was this in France? No, I was, uh, when I graduated, I wrote a thesis on the Asian crisis, which led me to obtain a job over there. So I was based in Shanghai at the time. I left the hotel industry and went into consultancy and then into real estate uh, for the next 15 years, pretty much. Um, and I joined a very large uh, Middle Eastern group called the Al-Bahar Group, which has various investments, and I was in charge of their real estate investments. And eventually, I was looking after one of the property development companies we had invested in in uh, Thailand, so it brought me back to Asia for a while. Mm -hmm. Property company, which we eventually sold, and the board of the group invited me to join the board of one of the company they had invested in, which was Yotel, early 2014. Uh, and you were in Asia the whole, the whole time before I was that. Dubai, Bangkok, Shanghai back and forth. So Brilliant. basically the bulk of my career was Genetic. between yeah. uh, the Middle East and the Far East, right? Brilliant. So it was quite interesting. Your hotel was a startup, kind of, a uh, small hotel enterprise with four hotels. And the reason I was invited to join this board was, you know, to work with the management team and uh, to design a business plan to grow this company to the next level. Right. And was it privately owned at the time? Yep. Yeah. Still is. Yeah. Uh, still is. It was completely owned at the time. Well, it was jointly owned by the founders of the business right. and yeah. the Al Bahar group as a kind of LP investor. Okay. Uh, so I was representing the LP in these meetings and trying to work out a business plan and so forth. And then things Things have not worked out exactly as planned and there was a decision made that maybe it was time to restructure the investment into Yotel. And frankly speaking, to my surprise, uh, I was uh, invited to join the management team and, and take over the uh, CEO role at Yotel. And I first said, no, I... <laughs> I haven't worked in a hotel company for 15 plus years. Yeah. And, uh, and you didn't uh, like it when you started. <laughs> well, it's not like I didn't like it, but I, was, I had no real passion for it and so yeah. forth. And then eventually, eventually, the chairman of the group and a number of people told me, look, we're not asking you to you know, run a hotel. We're asking you to build a company. And that's what you're pretty good at. I've done it on several occasions in the past and you know, build them, sell them, build them, sell them and so forth. So why, why, why don't, what, that's what you should do with the hotel, just grow a uh, multinational hotel company. And uh, Anyway, I thought it was super attractive. I spent a lot of time with my friends, looking at a lot of investors, yeah, lot yeah. Of partners, and they told me, Hubert, this concept is absolutely amazing. You just just should go for it. So long story short, I said, okay, fine, let's do it, right? Brilliant. Uh, and let's get cracking with it. And it's that's just just over five years ago. Amazing, mm -hmm. amazing. And what's, so what's the concept and the story behind it? So Yotel was founded just 
over 12 years ago uh, by Simon Woodruff, who's a non-hotelier. It was quite interesting. And I think he looked at uh, the hotel uh, kind of spectrum and realized it was rather boring and, uh, and rather <laughs> not in tune with what uh, kind of the 21st century traveler and consumer is looking for. And in a very traditional, basically following a simple rule of the more you pay, the more you get, uh, where when we are actually in a world of transparency, affordability, and experiences. And I think he also got a lot of inspiration from different businesses he had set up and completely different industries okay, from okay. his uh, restaurant businesses uh, and also from his travel experiences with airlines and how airlines managed to create a wonderful experience, at least for their premium passengers, yeah. uh, in a very small amount of space, right? Yeah, I think yeah. an airline became a key source of inspiration for a business as to um, how those, you know, um, aircraft carrier managed to create such a wonderful experience over like a first class cabin, which is typically between three and four square meter, you know, charge a lot for it, yeah. uh, provide a multifunctional experience, which is both, you know, a sleeping pod, an office, a dining room, a movie theater and get away with it and having people pay five, six times more to sit down there than elsewhere. And, and, and this whole kind of concept that we thought were very interesting, how airlines utilize technology to fast track the their passengers through the check-in process, uh, into the aircraft, select their seats and all this good stuff. Yeah, yeah. So all of this kind of inspired, I think, Simon and the team at the time. And, and Utel was born thinking, okay, how do we create a product which is premium, multifunctional, and affordable in key cities around the world. And, and eventually the conclusion was, well, the only way to do that is to provide to our target customers what they need and not what they don't need, right? Yeah. Uh, and so remove from the room all the non-essential elements and just focus on the essential luxuries. So, and we thought, okay, in today's world, people travel a lot, they travel often, they don't travel for long. The average length of stay of a trip is two or three days. And yeah, and everybody's looking for a great experience at an affordable price. So yeah. if, with, with that customers in mind, uh, we thought, well, then space is not the major differentiator, right? If you're only in your room for two nights, one night, and actually during those two days or three days you're going to spend it in a place, most of the time you're going to spend it discovering where you're at, either yeah. for work or for leisure or for whatever reason, then you really spend just a few hours in your room, right? So what you need in a room is not a lot of space. What you need in a room is a great bed, a great shower, yeah. a great cocoon environment, lots of technology to charge your batteries and, and, and so forth. Uh, but but having a 40 square meter room is not essential. Um, and that's very important because we were able to remove by focusing on that and saying, okay, let's design great rooms as the first class aircraft do, you know, small space, but very well designed, yeah, very yeah. well built off and removing the real estate we were able to remove the most expensive element of a hotel, which was the land, Just the, yeah. right? Uh, and as a result, our hotels became more affordable to build, naturally, right? Which allows us to break even and make money for our investors at a lower price point. And we then can reach an affordable price point with a good experience. Uh, we also Brilliant. removed all the non-essential services of hotels. We've seen over the 1970s, 80s hotels getting involved in all sorts of businesses they shouldn't be in. Why, why are hotels offering six, seven different restaurants? There are great restaurateurs in every city to do that. Why are sure. they offering yeah. spa services? A great healthcare company is doing that. Uh, and on and on and on. So we thought, let's just focus on what's important for a hotel customer, which is the room, a great lounge to, to chill and hang out and have a good breakfast in the morning. Yeah. And also a health center because we've realized that today's customers are always, you know, health conscious. You want to do so the gym, work out, yeah. yeah. And that's how Utah was born, and so we started doing business. Brilliant. And did you start in um, in the airports? Yeah, so funnily enough... Because only got two brands, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. So I, I suppose at the time in 2007, when the idea started to be rolled out, as I said, a lot of our inspiration came from the airline industry. So quite naturally, airports become the area where we thought, well, let's test the idea there. And so the first hotel to open was in Gatwick Airport in 2007, right. very quickly, quickly followed by uh, London Heathrow Airport and then Amsterdam Schiphol Airport. Small yeah. hotels, 50 rooms yeah. on average, um, you know, located right into the terminal and targeting firstly and foremost one type of customer, uh, the passenger, right? Yeah. In transit, checking in early. So one night stay. Uh, yeah. yeah, or just a few hours stay. Which is a few, right, right, right. what we realized, like maybe 
we should give full flexibility to our consumer and say, instead of telling them you need to book a whole night, just book the number of hours you need. I need from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. because that's when I need to wait for my aircraft, give it away, all right? Uh, which creates operational challenges because you yeah. need to clean up the room several times a day and so forth, but which meets exactly what the customer wants and also allows us to be affordable because instead of say, sending a 24 hour stay, we just sell again, exactly what the consumer wants. So that's where we started in 2007 and 2008. The three little airport hotels, which still exist <laughs> yeah. today and still do exceptionally well, were very, well received by you know the global travelers uh, yeah. there was a huge amount of publicity uh, i remember i wasn't involved in the business then but i remember reading a lot about it it was it was like so different right it took the market by by storm that at the time the investors group decided look well it's working it's fantastic yeah we need to bring this one level further which is let's bring the concept in the city let's not just be an airport hotel let's be just a hotel yeah. right so the group embarked into a strategy which was let's create one flagship property in what's probably the most prominent hotel market in the world, New York City. Let's make it big. Let's make it really amazing. And let's launch the brand. And from there, we'll start growing the company. Awesome. And was that, op you opened that or was that already started? No, so to the group, uh, our holding company yeah. was already involved at the time, the right. Al-Bahar Group. Uh, I was still in a different uh, division at the time. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I, I knew a lot about it, yeah. of course, especially it was a big investment. So. Yotel New York was born um, and opened in 2011. Amazing. 713 keys, right? Wow, we we wow. were managing three airport hotels, averaging 50 keys 50, at the yeah. time, and suddenly we're managing this giant property in New York. And where, whereabouts is it based? Uh, it's or? based on 42nd and 10th Street, so Midtown yeah. West, right? Yeah. Uh, Hell's Kitchen, which is today one of the most dynamic, amazing district of New York. But I yeah. tell you, back in 2011, it was really like, kind of maybe upcoming, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's very cool now. It's super cool. It's like yeah. where all the cool restaurants are. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of great condominium. It's super accessible. It's very close to by Hudson Yard and so forth. Yeah, yeah. 2011 was a bit of a different story. 2011 in New York, we were still in a post-GFC kind of environment. It was a bit sour, you know, yeah. the overall environment and uh, both domestically and internationally. Yeah. Anyway, the hotel opened with a big bang, July 2011. First year of operation, the hotel achieves an 80% occupancy rate. And ever since then, the hotel has been pretty much fully booked. Amazing. Right? We're running a 93, 94% occupancy rate year after year, year and after year. And this is still the kind of two night stays on average? It's actually, funnily enough, it's actually increased a bit. We're now at two and a half night stays, right? So people definitely enjoy it. Uh, although the cabins were definitely designed around a short a stay, short, but yeah. we see more and more long stay. And it's also... Quite amazing because when that hotel opened in 2011 in Manhattan, there were 85,000 hotel rooms in Manhattan, right? And Airbnb was not yet launched. Right, right. Uh, today in Manhattan, you've got 130,000 hotel rooms. There's another 15,000 coming up, right? Wow. Um, obviously, Airbnb launched. There's now, I'm not exactly sure, but 80,000 apartments listed in Manhattan alone. 80,000. So if you think about it, the supply in Manhattan of short stay accommodation has more than doubled since we opened that hotel. The occupancy rate hasn't moved one dot, right? So it proves the strength of the concept. And that's what got me really excited back in 2013, 14, when I was offered to join. Because I thought, yeah. That's quite amazing, a concept like that, right? How resilient it is and how popular it is. Uh, and New York, is a cutthroat market, right? I mean, it's not like yeah. not easy to do business there. So I got super excited, got you know, got involved, and on the back of those original three airport hotels, which we now call the Yotel Air properties because uh, uh, of, of their uniqueness within airports, yeah. and uh, Yotel uh, New York, we started to launch the next phase of development for the company. Brilliant. And is it what you expected it would be like? Well, yes and no. Uh, so when, when I embarked uh, uh, in the business, we signed up with all the investors on a five-year business plan, and we set up a number of targets, right? And, and uh, I had, as I said earlier, a bit of time to think about all these and travel around the world and talk to a lot of investors to really test the waters, how fast can we go? And we said, look, there's no reasons why within five years we shouldn't have 50 hotels, right? Which was quite bullish, given that we had four, right? Yeah. Uh, this concept has got so much traction in New York, there's absolutely no doubt if you look at key cities around the world, you know, around the world, which is critical, from Tokyo to Sydney to Singapore to Los Angeles, whatever, you will we'll find a market, we will find the yo customer, right? Uh, and, and our investment thesis also, if you look at it from an investor point of view, building is very efficient kind of hotel real estate assets will be very attractive in these markets where the land is super expensive, yeah, right? Yeah. So we can unlock value on projects which are uh, probably 
which were until then perceived as undoable, too difficult, hotels are not going to work. So we embarked into that. And today we have now 13 hotels in operation. We're opening number 14 at the end of the month in Amsterdam. Amazing. And we have another 17 under construction. So we're already wow. at 30 properties, you know, and at various stages, either open or under construction to be delivered over the next 24 months. And we continue and finding new investment partners, new real estate companies who keep on getting attracted by this concept. So in one hand, if I look at it big picture, are we on track with the plan as it work as planned? Oh yeah, even better. It's absolutely amazing. If you go into the details, it hasn't worked exactly as planned. It's been a bit yeah, more difficult does. with it. <laughs> nothing does, right? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. And so what's your like working week like? Are you are you focusing on these new openings and, and looking at new locations? Are you, are you running it operationally? I, I, look, I think I've got, I'm very fortunate and blessed. I've got one of the you know, most attractive jobs in the world because in one hand, we're building a company. So it's very much an entrepreneurial environment. It's, it still has this kind of startup kind of environment and excitement and, and speed. On the other hand, we're definitely becoming a bigger company, right? When yeah. I started, we were nine employees. Uh, we're now 65 employees in London, plus employees in New York and Singapore, plus yeah. all the hotel employees. Um, so we also have the multinational enterprise challenges, right? We do business. We have hotels in operation from San Francisco to Singapore, and we've just announced our first hotel in Australia. So we're really spread all across the world, yeah. which does create a number of challenges. So the way to deal with this in my kind of day-to-day, weekly uh, working life is, firstly, I try to balance how much time I spend you know, with the team uh, and, and, and dealing with operational issues and then how much time I need to spend on you know, traveling, yeah. meeting our investment partners, working with the hotels, etc. And I basically spend one week in London, one week traveling, one week in London, one week traveling, right? Um, and London's your home base? Based in London yeah. with the rest of most of the team, yeah. uh, you know, and that's where our heads of departments are. And that's, you know, where we work on the business plans, we build the infrastructure, we work on HR uh, related uh, issues, etc. That's, you know, so one week, I'm basically very much in the back office working in, in a building with the team, the company. And the other week, I'm with the investors on all focus on growth. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. What's been the biggest challenge you faced? Uh, I think, honestly, the biggest challenge for any enterprise, generally speaking, but specifically small and fast-growing enterprise, are people. Uh, building a team is uh, is difficult. Uh, it's funny because, in one hand, you know, we're when I listen to you know students or uh, when I read about them in newspapers, etc., and everybody says, "Oh, we want to be part of startups. It's so exciting. We want to be." Part of big MNCs, etc. But then there's the hard reality of joining a startup, and yeah. it's hard. It's hard work, yeah. right? And the reality is, also startups are not great training grounds because you just need to get on with it. And if you just get out of uni, you know, you're pretty very bright and super excited, etc. But you haven't trained yet. So yeah. you want to be so a bit start- more, bit more direction Correct. in training. Yeah, uh, you need to. Right? You need yeah. mentors. You need and, and the reality is, in an enterprise like Yotel, we go so fast. You know, we are not yet very good at it. We try, and it's definitely part of our growth plan to build careers, learning development programs, etc. But at this stage, it's still a little bit all over the place. So you need to attract right talents, dynamic, seize the vision of the company that enjoys this kind of entrepreneurial environment, but at the same time has got the experience. And I've got a second problem that very well experienced uh, kind of executive in companies. Well, they're comfortably sitting in their armchairs with big, big jobs, you know, nice perks, Lots of people helping them, etc. And when you tell them, you know what, you need to come and join your hotel, and nobody's going to help you. <laughs> you know, you kind of go ten years behind. Have to do any uh, photo copying. Exactly. You know? So, building a team is difficult. I think for yeah. any any enterprise, any group, it's always yeah. difficult finding the right talents. It's a little bit exacerbated in our case because we're global, because uh, because we're growing so fast, because the challenges are multiple. Um, but I spend a lot of my time on. I'll be honest, and it's and it's working, and it's happening, and it's yeah. you know the, the, I think that the biggest success we'll have besides the fact that we've got all these hotels working hard and all this money and all this good stuff. As I said earlier, we started we're like you know less than ten people, and now we're we're a multinational companies with sixty five plus HQ employees, and all yeah. we've created all these employment opportunities in all these hotels across the world, and and, and creating that culture and people and when we see career path and we've seen some of our executives who started kind of mid-ranking roles within hotels and now they're general managers of hotels yeah that's to me is the greatest uh, source awesome. of satisfaction satisfaction yeah no definitely mm. it's interesting because I mean, a lot of young people even i find a lot of people are wanting to work for high growth mm-hmm. small firms versus big companies mm-hmm. it's a bit more personal you know kind of more family people care mm-hmm. um it's interesting the reality is often a little bit different you know you don't necessarily yeah. get well, you get, you get less support. You know, I think that 
And I was fortunate enough when I started a career, I worked in a groups. And even though eventually I did a circle in my career and going yeah. back to hospitality, etc. Yeah. It's good to start and have people to mentor you through your first year into the active world, right? Uh, some people don't need that, great, uh, yeah. but a lot of people do. And then you, you know, you, you fly with your own wings, and, you, and you, you can get- you can jump into an environment like ours. Now, the good thing now we're increasingly less of a startup, and we've got much more structures, and you know, we can um, enroll uh, executive at any levels yeah. and have the right programs to support them and grow them, etc. But the very very early days of a startup are very difficult. It's tough. I mean, uh, you've got to do everything. Yeah, right? it's interesting because if you if you've done if you've gone to university and mm-hmm. maybe you've done your masters your life's just been you laid out mm-hmm. you know you're, you're told what to do you do the study suddenly you're in the real in the real world yeah and you know, it's not the same as when you're in education I, I couldn't wait when i was a student to go into the real world and i've enjoyed every day since then but uh, but but it, there's an adjustment period and, yeah. and 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 for us it's very important to understand it because our business is built around um, a, a younger consumer and also a younger uh, employee Right, yeah. uh, and we believe that we're setting up an operation which should provide career opportunities to graduates and allow them to build up quickly their career. So it's very yeah. important for us, having said all what I've just said, that we create the environment which allows and makes this happen. Yeah. And you know, our hotels are not meant to be run by veteran general managers with thirty year plus experience. It's meant to be run by young, dynamic, excited entrepreneurial executive, probably graduated three four years ago. Right. That's it. That's that's what that's the vision, right? Yeah. Because they build the energy that needs to drive into the hotel and so forth. Yeah. And we also have, you know, we're building infrastructure around in our head office and so forth to help them. Yeah. And ensure yeah. that, you know, you know, we, we give them enough leeway to make decisions at the same time we ensure that they don't uh fall over, right? And now so you started with one investor. I know you've recently Mm-hmm. taken more investment and has that changed the dynamics yeah, a little bit right and uh so two years ago uh with our original investors uh the al bahar group we decided that you know to fast track our growth um to validate the business as well and to help in operation it would be in our interest to sell down part of the business to an institution a group with great expertise in that domain uh, so that naturally brought us to speak with a number of groups, and more specifically with Starwood Capital, which obviously has a huge amount of experience in hospitality, yeah. being behind the you know, creation of Starwood Hotels and Resorts, and generally speaking as an investor in that industry. So a, a group which has the investment capabilities, the global network, but also the operational expertise because they have actually run hotel companies. And you know, even though it would be dilutive to bring a group like this in our group, in our company, and, and to us saying, you know, why you do that? You're doing yeah. very well. Why you sell down your company? So well, because it's going to add much more value than the share of the capital we're going to lose. So eventually we worked at a very interesting partnership with Charlie Capital, whereby uh, the Al-Bahar Group sold them 30% of, our, uh, of their shares in U-Hotel uh, to the fund. Yeah. And uh, they've also agreed to deploy part of their fund to invest into U-Hotel property. So there was multiple impact in there. It allowed us, obviously, to do more hotels. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, we've done U-Hotel Amsterdam with them, U-Hotel Edinburgh, which opened last month, U-Hotel Glasgow, which is opening early next year. So that you've bought the buildings... Well, they, they, bought the they bought yeah. the building. They bought the building. We've converted them in where they are right now in either under conversion or uh, open uh, properties under the hotel standards. Um, and we're looking at many more deals with them. So to, to immediately, it has Amazing. a growth impact, right? Yeah. To be associated with the fund, allows us to bo- do more hotels. But it's more than that. And it's, you know, we didn't just want to have a capital partner because the reality is we already, you know, it's great to have a strategic capital partner, but we also have many others, to be very frank. I mean, we work with any capital partners out there from the Blackstone to the Wheelock to the whatever of the world, or family offices or real estate development companies. I mean, we're very, very open. But what Starwood also brought to us is credibility, frankly speaking, because, you know, whilst you tell with people would think, well, that's interesting what's going on with you tell, but the fact that an institution like Starwood invests into the company is like, I think the whole world suddenly realized what like, the heck is going serious. on there. These yeah. guys in Utah are certainly doing something right, which is good. And and beyond that is you know, a real help. You know, I mean, the Starwood uh, team is fantastic. They uh, they know the business. I mean, you speak to real estate investors who know underst- who understand hotels as well as hotel managers. I mean, it's yeah. just amazing. So for me, certainly so, so as a CEO and having guys from Starwood on our board is very helpful Brilliant. to bounce ideas, build a business, recruit yeah. people, etc. And then they're quite hands off. 
so that you, that can you use them when? Uh, I don't think Starwood would. I think they would agree with me that they're not a hands-off investor. Oh, they, right, they, okay. They're a private equity <laughs> hands-on investor, uh, which I uh, which is perfectly fine with me. The yeah, Alba yeah. Group is also a hands-on investor. I think there's a lot of passion from both from the top heads of yeah. Starwood Capital and Alba Har Group that they they both love this little project hotel, and so they're always quite interested in what's going on, and and it's great. That's and great. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. You know, you know, the worst thing is actually a hands-off investor that doesn't care about what you do. I mean, no, no, uh, Yotel is high up in their agenda, which is great. So great. we have attention. We look at so many projects together. We review business plans together and so forth, you know. And they also uh, force us to be a better management company, right? Uh, yeah. Private equity groups require way more reporting, probably. More rigor. Uh, more rigor, which yeah. is good. Yeah, it's great. We, we need to be ready for yeah. that anyway. More options, better decisions. Agreed. No, it's brilliant. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Have you seen the market, the hotel market change since you've been there? How, how have you seen it develop? And- it's changing constantly. Uh, there are some global trends and then because we're exposed to many different markets, we see also many different local trends, right? right? Um, I mentioned one earlier about New York, right? Yeah. That has gone through such a supply increase. I mean, that has to change the way you run a hotel. When yeah. your supply double in five years, six years, seven years, you know, uh, you need to run your business in a more cutthroat manner yeah, uh, yeah. And, um, uh, than, than probably you used to. <laughs> but you're, you're, I think it sounds like your concept has, has, is playing well to that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, correct. And because and, on the global trends, which is certainly supporting the business, is generally speaking, travelers are more cost conscious. Right, uh, for different reasons. Um, one is because maybe the economy is doing not that great, or is expected to do not that great. Two is because enterprises are way smarter nowadays in how they manage their corporate travel. And yeah. It's not just all business class, all five star hotels for everyone. Far from it. And I'm talking about the biggest MNCs out there, yeah. not just small enterprise. Uh, and the leisure traveler, the, the independent uh, traveler, is also traveling very differently because he's got all the information from the internet and so forth. Yeah. And also different yeah. options, right? Besides hotels, you know, have apartments. You got all sorts of ways to stay. Uh, you can go glamping, whatever. There's also many different trends coming up out there. Yeah. So I went glamping a few weeks yeah. ago. <laughs> so this this uh, these trends actually, yeah. well, they create a more competitive environment. They play quite well for us, right? Because yeah. we are this affordable, cool, high quality product. And it kind of ticks the box for these travelers. Yeah. And you know, so you'll see we benefit from some travelers realize who used to stay in probably more luxurious hotels and realize it's either too expensive or their company doesn't want to pay for it anymore, or what the heck, I don't need it. And so we see them going downstream towards us, or the other way around is those people saying, I want more experience. I'm tired of these budget hotels that provide me just convenience. I want something more cool. I want something more in line with my own, uh, my own me, right? Yeah. Uh, and as a result, and that's what they see in the hotel. This is more in line with their beliefs and, and so forth. So yeah. this kind of trends, well, you know, everyone says, are you not scared about this, Airbnb? Also, well, actually, so far, it's worked out quite well for us because we were well positioned. We're in a nice uh, part of the segment, in a nice niche, niche segment. Yeah. And then locally, as I said, there's plenty of different trends. I mean, we've got supply issues in New York. We, we've we got our two airport hotels in London, our hotel in Edinburgh, soon opening in Glasgow, soon yeah. opening another hotel in London. So we're very exposed to the UK and here we are in the middle of Brexit and yeah, yeah. and so forth. Who so, knows what's going to happen here? <laughs> but, you know, I think if you ask most hoteliers in the UK so far, yeah. it's actually work out quite well for them so so far so good well maybe people are staying and doing doing trips in the uk more um also yeah. the pound well the sterling is significantly so, cheaper than when i yeah. moved here four years ago so Massively. certainly yeah. makes the uk a much more affordable you know tourist destination yeah. for yeah. a lot of people yeah and airbnb have you seen um, yeah well airbnb has i mean clearly it has an impact line not to see that uh, but it's the, the funny thing is i think it has a it doesn't have a really an impact on on demand like as in the volume of demand quite the opposite it actually induced new demand you know because airbnb is growing globally but you know and so for us we see it here in london as in new york san francisco their yeah. head office the, um, in singapore it's even start everywhere right but our occupancy rate is doing very well what's what's Airbnb is doing so, so which means, which seems to indicate that they're inducing new demand into the into the market. Right? Yeah. What it does, I think, it impacts quite hard some segments, right? Probably the more luxuries, long stay kind of business, because now there's a lot of alternative to your traditional service apartment businesses. Yeah. And it impacts overall for everyone, including us, um, rates, right? Because more supply is tougher to build your rates, yeah. right? Yeah. So there's no doubt in my mind that without Airbnb, we would have seen probably a faster growth 
in our ADRs, average room rate uh, overall, than what we've seen. Now, we've see, still seen some very positive growth across the portfolio, so which is great. Yeah. But the fact that there's alternative accommodations uh, out there puts a bit of pressure on rates. Yeah. Interestingly, Airbnb is increasingly getting into the distribution of hotels, right? Uh, yeah, oh, really? They, yeah, they, they are starting to list hotels on their, on their website. Yeah. And Actually, are you... Uh, we've, we've tested one of our hotels, yeah, which is listed on Airbnb. And they get yeah. Well, it's it's still minimal business compared yeah, yeah. to our other distribution channels, yeah. but but it's very interesting that they're getting in there. That right? is so, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So Airbnb is increasingly becoming an online travel agent. Yeah. Honest, right? yeah. And, uh, which is another trend which we need to deal with, right? Uh, and it's a very different trend. Online travel agents are not negative. They bring in a lot of business and visibility for hotels. They're just expensive. Yes. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. But they charge They charge both the customer and... Airbnb and the does, yeah? Yeah. Uh, your booking.com and booking. Expedia charges the, the hotels. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. So. And what are the plans for the future? Well, we're continuing. Okay. So with, with Starwood that came on board two years ago, uh, with all these hotels coming online, we have two major plans going ahead, or three major plans going ahead. One is uh, obviously continue to continue growing, right? Uh, you know, we, we're doing well, but we're, we're not yet where we want to be. Uh, and we want to continue. And it's very important for our future because our objective right now is to establish those flagship properties in all these key cities around the world. Yeah. Um, so establish the brand, uh, uh, root it in those markets which we think are key for our long-term future and once we've done that we'll be able to grow locally right so okay. uh, like we've done in the US New York opened in 2011 we've just announced our 10th hotel a month ago so now the US is becoming a whole region so own, right? and then we're going to continue growing that similarly in, in the UK now we've got 5-6 hotels so we'll grow the regions around these flagship hotels so we need to continue establishing our footprint around the world yeah. that's a key objective of course in parallel, and as importantly, we need to continue building the operation, building the platform uh, to ensure that, you know, deliver on the results that investors have yeah. uh, appointed us for managing those hotels properly. So yeah. building the platform is as important because we need to deliver results to our investors. And then the third objective is, you know, and it's, it's to a certain extent, it's a more complex one is we need to, you know, we've integrated technology in the heart of our company and technology to facilitate and to improve guest experience f uh, technology. So to like make, check in, yeah. check out. Correct. Yeah. Uh, you know, remove some of the you know, traditional boring things you have to do in a hotel, as you said, yeah. check in, check out, whatever, yeah. queuing, paying, etc. Um Technology to facilitate and improve operations, um, and also technology just to continue remain an innovative and worthwhile brand, right? Yeah, I think that yeah, yeah. today's consumer is always looking for more, and it's difficult because it's so you know, remaining at the forefront of technology is not just about buying the latest TVs and the latest iPhone and all that. And a, it's not sustainable to always do that, and secondly, it's not really what it is. So, so we need to continue working on that and remaining innovative, etc. Yeah. So we've made uh, some time ago a partnership with a big a tech incubator called Plug and Play, okay, uh, based in uh, in uh, in the Valley, right. and they help us, you know, keep on reviewing new ideas, new innovations, so you can try some things, yeah, see if they work. introduce yeah. us to you know startups. It can be a startup of like one person seeing enough to just come up with a great idea, or yeah. actually a pretty well funded business which has already come up with that, and see continuously how we can integrate these ideas to continue being at the forefront of kind of the new hotel uh, industry. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. I love it. Great story. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you very much. I look forward to staying in one of your hotels soon. Please. And uh, yeah. You're most welcome. And I hope that uh, those listening to us had an interest in that and will visit our hotels very soon. Definitely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places. Bye.